Chapter 10 Pluto is, on the average, about forty times as far away from the Sun as is Mother Earth. Each square yard of Earth's surface receives about sixteen hundred times as much heat as does each of Pluto's. The Sun as seen from Pluto is a dim, wan speck. Even at perihelion, an event which occurs only once in two hundred forty-eight Tellurian years, and at noon and on the equator, Pluto is so bitterly cold that climactic conditions upon its surface simply cannot be described by, or to, warm-blooded, oxygen-breathing man. As good an indication as any can be given, perhaps, by mentioning the fact that it had taken the patrol's best engineers over six months to perfect the armor which Virgil Sams then wore. For no ordinary spacesuit would do. Space itself is not cold. The only loss of heat is by radiation into or through an almost perfect vacuum. In contact with Pluto's rocky, metallic soil, however, there would be conduction, and the magnitude of the inevitable heat loss made the Tellurian scientists gasp. "'Watch your feet, Verge,' had been Roderick Kinnison's insistent last thought. "'Remember those psychologists. If they stayed in contact with that ground for five minutes, they froze their feet to the ankles.' Not that the boys aren't good, but slipsticks sometimes slip in more ways than one. If your feet ever start to get cold, drop whatever you're doing and drive back here at max. Virgil Sams landed. His feet stayed warm. Finally, assured that the heaters of his suit could carry the load indefinitely, he made his way on foot into the settlement near which he had come to ground, and there he saw his first Polanian or, strictly speaking, he saw part of his first Polanian, for no three-dimensional creature has ever seen or ever will see in entirety any member of any of the frigid-blooded, poison-breathing races. Since life as we know it, organic, three-dimensional life, is based upon liquid water and gaseous oxygen, such life did not and could not develop upon planets whose temperatures are only a few degrees above absolute zero. Many, perhaps most of these ultra-frigid planets, have an atmosphere of sorts. Some have no atmosphere at all. Nevertheless, with or without atmosphere, and completely without oxygen and water, life, highly intelligent life, did develop upon millions and millions of such worlds. That life is not, however, strictly three-dimensional. Of necessity, even in the lowest forms, it possesses an extension into the hyper-dimension and it is this metabolic extension alone which makes it possible for life to exist under such extreme conditions. The extension makes it impossible for any human being to see anything of a Polanian except the fluid, amorphous, ever-changing thing which is his three-dimensional aspect of the moment, makes any attempt at description or portraiture completely futile. Virgil Sam stared at the Polanian, tried to see what it looked like, he could not tell whether it had eyes or antennae, legs, arms, or tentacles, teeth or beaks, talons or claws or feet, skin, scales, or feathers. It did not even remotely resemble anything that the lensman had ever seen, sensed, or imagined. He gave up, sent out an exploring thought. "'I am Virgil Sams, a Tellurian,' he sent out slowly, carefully, after he made contact with the outer fringes of the creature's mind. "'Is it possible for you, sir or madam, to give me a moment of your time?' "'Eminently possible, Lensman Sams, since my time is of completely negligible value.' The monster's mind flashed into accord with Sams with a speed and precision that made him gasp. That is, a part of it became en rapport with a part of his— Years were to pass before even the first lensman would know much more about the Polanian than he learned in that first contact. No human beings except the children of the lens ever were to understand even dimly the labyrinthine intricacies, the paradoxical complexities of the Polanian mind. Madam might be approximately correct, the native's thought went smoothly on. My name and your symbology is Twelfth Pilanipsi. By education, training, and occupation, I am a chief dexatroboper. I perceive that you are indeed a native of that hellish planet three, upon which it was assumed for so long that no life could possibly exist. 
but communication with your race has been almost impossible heretofore. Ah, the lens! A remarkable device, truly. I would slay you and take it, except for the obvious fact that only you can possess it. What? Dismay and consternation flooded Sam's mind. You already know the lens? No, yours is the first that any of us has perceived. The mechanics, the mathematics, and the basic philosophy of the thing, however, are quite clear. What? Sam's exclaimed again. You can, then, produce lenses yourselves? By no means, any more than you Tellurians can. There are magnitudes, variables, determinants, and forces involved, which no Polenian will ever be able to develop, to generate, or to control. I see. The lensman pulled himself together. For a first lensman, he was making a wretched showing indeed. Far from it, sir, the monstrosity assured him. Considering the strangeness of the environment into which you have voluntarily flung yourself so senselessly, your mind is well integrated and strong. Otherwise, it would have shattered. If our positions were reversed, the mere thought of the raging heat of your earth would— Come no closer, please. The thing vanished, reappeared many yards away. Her thoughts were a shudder of loathing, of terror, of sheer detestation. But to get on— I have been attempting to analyze and to understand your purpose without success. That failure is not too surprising, of course, since my mind is weak and my total power is small. Explain your mission, please, as simply as you can. Weak? Small? In view of the power the monstrosity had just shown, Sam's probed for irony, for sarcasm or pretense. There was no trace of anything of the kind. He tried, then, for fifteen solid minutes, to explain the galactic patrol, but at the end the Palanian's only reaction was one of blank non-comprehension. "'I fail completely to perceive the use of, or the need for, such an organization,' she stated flatly. "'This altruism, what good is it? It is unthinkable that any other race would take the risks or exert any effort for us, any more than we would for them.' Ignore and be ignored, as you must already know, is the prime tenet. But there is a little commerce between our worlds. Your people did not ignore our psychologists, and you are not ignoring me, Sams pointed out. Oh, none of us is perfect, Pilanipsi replied, with a mental shrug and what seemed to be an airy wave of a multi-tentacled member. That ideal, like any other, can only be approached asymptotically, never reached, and I, being somewhat foolish and silly, as well as weak and vacillant, am much less perfect than most. Flabbergasted, Sam's tried a new tack. I might be able to make my position clearer if I knew you better. I know your name, and that you are a woman of Palane Seven. It is a measure of Virgil Sam's real size that he actually thought woman and not merely female. But all I can understand of your occupation is the name you have given it. What does a chief dexatroboper do? She, or he, or perhaps it, is a supervisor of the work of dexatroboping. The thought, while perfectly clear, was completely meaningless to Sam's, and the Palanian knew it. She tried again. Dexatroboping has to do with nourishment? No, with nutrients. Ah, farming, agriculture, Sam's thought, but this time it was the Polanian who could not grasp the concept. Hunting? Fishing? No better. Show me, then, please. She tried, but demonstration, too, was useless, for to Sam's the Polanian's movements were pointless indeed. The peculiarly flowing, subtly changing thing darted back and forth, rose and fell, appeared and disappeared, undergoing the whole cyclic changes in shape and form and size, in aspect and texture. It was now spiny, now tentacular, now scaly, now covered with peculiarly repellent feather-like fronds, each oozing a crimson slime. But it apparently did not do anything whatever. The net result of all its activity was, apparently, zero. There, it is done, 
Pelinipsy's thought again came clear. You observed and understood? You did not. That is strange, baffling. Since the lens did improve communication and understanding tremendously, I hoped that it might extend to the physical as well, but there must be some basic, fundamental difference, the nature of which is at present obscure. I wonder, if I had a lens too, but no. But yes, Sams broke in eagerly. Why don't you go to Aresia and be tested for one? You have a magnificent, a really tremendous mind. It is of lensman grade in every respect except one. You simply don't want to use it. Me? Go to Aresia? The thought would have been, in a Tellurian, a laugh of scorn. How utterly silly! How abysmally stupid! There would be personal discomfort, quite possibly personal danger. And two lenses would be little or no better than one in resolving differences between our two continua, which are probably, in fact, incommensurable. Well, then, Sam's thought, almost viciously, can you introduce me to someone who is stupider, sillier, and more foolish than you are? Not here on Pluto, no. The Polanian took no offense. That was why it was I who interviewed the earlier Tellurian visitors, and why I am now conversing with you. The others avoided you. I see. Sam's thought was grim. How about the home planet, then? Ah, undoubtedly. In fact, there is a group, a club of such persons. None of them is, of course, as insane, as aberrant as you are, but they are all much more so than I am. Who of this club would be most interested in becoming a lensman? Talek was the least stable member of the new thought club when I left Seven. Kragzek's a close second. There may, of course, have been changes since then. But I cannot believe that even Talek, even Talek at his outrageous worst, would be crazy enough to join your patrol. Nevertheless, I must see him myself. Can you and will you give me a chart of a routing from here to Palane Seven? I can, and I will. Nothing you have thought will be of any use to me. That will be the easiest and quickest way of getting rid of you. The Palanian spread a completely detailed chart in Sam's mind, snapped the telepathic line, and went unconcernedly about her incomprehensible business. Sam's, mind reeling, made his way back to his boat and took off and as the light-years and the parsecs screamed past, he sank deeper and deeper into a welter of unproductive speculation. What were, really, those Palanians? How could they, really, exist as they seemed to exist? And why had some of that Dexatrobopers, whatever that meant, thoughts come in so beautifully sharp and clear and plain, while others— he knew that his lens would receive and would convert into his own symbology any thought or message, however coded or garbled or however sent or transmitted. The lens was not at fault. His symbology was. There were concepts, things, actualities, occurrences, so foreign to Tellurian experience that no reference existed. Hence the human mind lacked the channels, the mechanisms, to grasp them. He and Roderick Kinnison had glibly discussed the possibility of encountering forms of intelligent life so alien that humanity would have no point whatever of contact with them. After what Sams had just gone through, that was more of a possibility than either he or his friend had believed, and he hoped grimly, as he considered how seriously this partial contact with the Polanians had upset him, that the possibility would never become a fact. He found the Palanian system easily enough, and Palane Seven. That planet, of course, was almost as dark upon its sunward side as upon the other, and its inhabitants had no use for light. Pilanipsi's instructions, however, had been minute and exact. Hence, Sam's had very little trouble in locating the principal city, or rather, the principal village, since there were no real cities. He found the planet's one spaceport. What a thing to call a port! He checked back, recalled exactly this part of his interview with Pluto's chief Dexatrobober. The place upon which spaceships land, had been her thought, when she showed him exactly where it was in relationship to the town. 
Just that, and nothing else. It had been his mind, not hers, that had supplied the docks and cradles, the service cars, the officers, and all the other things taken for granted in space fields everywhere as Sam's knew them. Either the Palanians had not perceived the trappings with which Sam's had invested her visualization, or she had not cared enough about his misapprehension to go to the trouble of correcting it. He did not know which. The whole area was as bare as his hand, except for the pitted, scarred, slagged-down spots which showed so clearly what driving blasts would do to such inconceivably cold rock and metal, Palaneport was in no way distinguishable from any other unimproved portion of the planet's utterly bleak surface. There were no signals. He had been told of no landing conventions. Apparently it was everyone for himself. Wherefore Sam's tremendous landing lights blazed out, and with their aid he came safely to ground. He put on his armor and strode to the airlock then changed his mind and went to the cargo port instead. He had intended to walk, but in view of the rugged and deserted field and the completely unknown terrain between the field and the town, he decided to ride the creep instead. This vehicle, while slow, could go literally anywhere. It had a cigar-shaped body of magnalloy. It had big, soft, tough tires. It had cleated tracks. It had air and water propellers. It had folding wings. It had driving, braking, and steering jets. It could traverse the deserts of Mars, the oceans and swamps of Venus, the crevassed glaciers of Earth, the jagged, frigid surface of an iron asteroid, and the cratered, fluffy topography of the Moon, if not with equal speed, at least with equal safety. Sams released the thing and drove it into the cargo lock, noting mentally that he would have to exhaust the air of that lock into space before he again broke the inner seal. The ramp slid back into the ship. The cargo port closed. Here he was. Should he use his headlights or not? He did not know the Palanian's reaction to or attitude toward light. It had not occurred to him while at Pluto to ask, and it might be important. The landing lights of his vessel might already have done his cause irreparable harm. He could drive by starlight if he had to, but he needed light and he had not seen a single living or moving thing. There was no evidence that there was a Palanian within miles. While he had known, with his brain, that Palane would be dark, he had expected to find buildings and traffic, ground cars, planes, and at least a few spaceships, and not this vast nothingness. If nothing else, there must be a road from Palane's principal city to its only spaceport, but Sam's had not seen it from his vessel and he could not see it now. At least he could not recognize it. Wherefore he clutched in the tractor drive and took off in a straight line toward town. The going was more than rough. It was really rugged. But the creep was built to stand up under punishment and its pilot's chair was sprung and cushioned to exactly the same degree. Hence, while the course itself was infinitely worse than the smoothly paved approaches to Rigelston, Sam's found this trip much less bruising than the other had been. Approaching the village, he dimmed his road lights and slowed down. At its edge, he cut them entirely and inched his way forward by starlight alone. What a town! Virgil Sam's had seen the inhabited places of almost every planet of civilization. He had seen cities laid out in circles, sectors, ellipses, triangles, squares, parallelopipeds, practically every plan known to geometry. He had seen structures of all shapes and sizes, narrow skyscrapers, vast spreading one-stories, polyhedra, domes, spheres, semicylinders, and erect and inverted full and truncated cones and pyramids. Whatever the plan or the shapes of the component units, however, those inhabited places had, without exception, been understandable. But this! Sam's, his eyes now completely dark accustomed, could see fairly well, but the more he saw, the less he grasped. There was no plan, no coherence or unity whatever. It was as though a cosmic hand had flung a few hundreds of buildings, of incredibly and senselessly varied shapes and sizes and architectures, upon an otherwise empty plain 
and as though each structure had been allowed ever since to remain in whatever location and attitude it had chanced to fall. Here and there were jumbled piles of three or more utterly incongruous structures. There were a few whose arrangement was almost orderly. Here and there were large, irregularly shaped areas of bare, untouched ground. There were no streets, at least nothing that the man could recognize as such. Sam's headed the creep for one of those open areas, then stopped. He clutched the tracks, set the brakes, and killed the engines. "'Go slow, fellow,' he advised himself then. "'Until you find out what a dexatroboper actually does while working at his trade, don't take chances of interfering or of doing damage.' No lensman knew, then, that frigid-blooded poison-breathers were not strictly three-dimensional, but Sams did know that he had actually seen things which he could not understand. He and Kinnison had discussed such occurrences calmly enough, but the actuality was enough to shake even the mind of civilization's first lensman. He did not need to be any closer, anyway. He had learned the Polanian's patterns well enough to lens them from a vastly greater distance than his present one. This personal visit to Palainopolis had been a gesture of friendliness, not a necessity. Talik? Kragzex? He sent out the questing, querying thought. Lensman Virgil Sams of Saul Three, calling Talik and Kragzex of Palain Seven. Kragzex acknowledging Virgil Sams, a thought snapped back as diamond clear, as precise as Palinipses had been. Is Talik here, or anywhere on the planet? He is here, but he is emphosing at the moment. He will join us presently. Damnation! There it was again. First dexatropoping, and now this. One moment, please, Sam's requested. I fail to grasp the meaning of your thought. So, I perceive, the fault is, of course, mine, in not being able to attune my mind fully to yours. Do not take this, please, as any aspersion upon the character or strength of your own mind. Of course not. I am the first Tellurian you have met? Yes. I have exchanged thoughts with one other Palanian, and the same difficulty existed. I can neither understand nor explain it. But it is as though there are differences between us so fundamental that in some matters mutual comprehension is in fact impossible. A masterly summation, and undoubtedly a true one. This emphosing, then, if I read correctly, your race has only two sexes? You read correctly. I cannot understand. There is no close analogy. However, emphosing has to do with reproduction. I see. And Sam saw not only a frankness brand new to his experience, but also a new view of both the powers and the limitations of his lens. It was by its very nature of precisionist grade. It received thoughts and translated them precisely into English. There was some leeway, but not much. If any thought was such that there was no extremely close counterpart or referent in English, the lens would not translate it at all, but would simply give it a hitherto meaningless symbol a symbol which would from that time on be associated by all lenses everywhere with that one concept and no other. Sams realized then that he might, some day, learn what a dextra trobroper actually did and what the act of emphosing actually was, but that he probably would not. Talik joined them then, and Sams again described glowingly, as he had done so many times before, the galactic patrol of his imaginings and plannings. Kragzex refused to have anything to do with such a thing, almost as abruptly as Pilinipsi had done. But Talik lingered and wavered. "'It is widely known that I am not entirely sane,' he admitted. "'Which may explain the fact that I would very much like to have a lens. But I gather, from what you have said, that I would probably not be given a lens to use purely for my own selfish purposes.' "'That is my understanding.' Sams agreed. I was afraid so. Talik's mean was, woebegone is the only word for it. I have work to do, projects, you know, of difficulty, of extreme complexity and scope, sometimes even approaching danger. A lens would be of tremendous use. 
How? Sams asked. If your work is of enough importance to enough people, Mentor would certainly give you a lens. This would benefit me, only me. We of Palain, as you probably already know, are selfish, mean-spirited, small-souled, cowardly, furtive, and sly. Of what you call bravery we have no trace. We attain our ends by stealth, by indirection, by trickery, and deceit. Ruthlessly, the lens was giving Virgil Sams the uncompromisingly exact English equivalent of the Polinian's every thought. We operate, when we must operate at all, openly, with the absolutely irreducible minimum of personal risk. These attitudes and attributes will, I have no doubt, preclude all possibility of lensmanship for me and for every member of my race. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Although Virgil Sams did not know it, this was one of the really critical moments in the coming into being of the Galactic Patrol. By a conscious, a tremendous effort, the first lensman was lifting himself above the narrow, intolerant prejudices of human experience, and was consciously attempting to see the whole through Mentor's Aresian mind, instead of through his Tellurian own. That Virgil Sams was the first human being to be born with the ability to accomplish that feat even partially was one of the reasons why he was the first wearer of the lens. Not necessarily, first lensman Virgil Sams said and meant. He was inexpressibly shocked, revolted in every human fiber by what this unhuman monster had so frankly and callously thought. There were, however, many things which no human being ever could understand, and there was not the shadow of a doubt that this Talek had a really tremendous mind. You have said that your mind is feeble. If so, there is no simple expression of the weakness of mind. I can perceive only one, the strictly human, facet of the truth. In a broader view, it is distinctly possible that your motivation is at least as noble as mine. And to complete my argument, you work with other Polanians, do you not, to reach a common goal? At times, yes. Then you can conceive of the desirability of working with non Polanian entities toward an end which would benefit both races? Postulating such an end, yes, but I am unable to visualize any such. Have you any specific project in mind? Not at the moment, Sam's ducked. He had already fired every shot in his locker. I am quite certain, however, that if you go to Aresia, you will be informed of several such projects. There was a period of silence, then, I believe that I will go to Aresia at that, Talek exclaimed brightly. I will make a deal with your friend Mentor. I will give him a share, say fifty per cent, or forty, of the time and effort I save on my own projects. Just so you go, Talek. Sam's concealed right manfully his real opinion of the Polanian scheme. When can you go? Right now? By no means. I must first finish this project. A year, perhaps, or more, or possibly less. Who knows? Talek cut communications and Sam's frowned. He did not know the exact length of Seven's year, but he knew that it was long, very long. Chapter 11 a small black scout ship, commanded jointly by Master Pilot John K. Kinnison and Master Electronicist Mason M. Northrup, was blasting along a course very close indeed to RA-17 D-10. In equipment and personnel, however, she was not an ordinary scout. Her control room was so full of electronics racks and computing machines that there was scarcely footway in any direction. Her graduated circles and vernier scales were of a size and a fineness usually seen only in the great vessels of the Galactic Survey, and her crew, instead of the usual twenty-odd men, numbered only seven, one cook, three engineers, and three watch officers. For some time the young third officer, then at the board, had been studying something on his plate, comparing it minutely with the chart clipped into the rack in front of him. Now he turned, with a highly exaggerated deference, to the two lensmen. Sirs, 
Which of your magnificences is officially the commander of this here bucket of odds and ends at the present instant? Him. Jack used his cigarette as a pointer. The guy with the misplaced plucked eyebrow on his upper lip. I don't come on duty until sixteen hundred hours. One precious Tellurian minute yet in which to dream of the beauties of Earth so distant in space and in both past and future time. Huh? Beauties? Plural? Next time I see a party whose pictures are cluttering up this whole ship, I'll tell her about your polygamous ideas. I'll ignore that crack about my mustache, though, since you can't raise one of your own. I'm ignoring you, too. Like this, see? Ostentatiously turning his back upon the lounging Kinnison, Northrop stepped carefully over three or four breadboard hookups and stared into the plate over the watch officer's shoulder. He then studied the chart. Vos is los, Stu. I don't see a thing. More Jack's line than yours, Mace. This system we're heading for is a triple, and the chart says it's a double. Natural enough, of course. This whole region is unexplored, so the charts are astronomicals, not surveys. But that makes us prime discoverers, and our commanding officer, and the book says officer, not officers, has got to— That's me now, Jack announced, striding grandly toward the plate. Amsgre, Ubsve, I will name the baby. I will report. I will go down in history. Bounce back, small fry. You weren't at the time of discovery. Northrop placed a huge hand flat against Jack's face and pushed gently. You'll go down, sure enough. Not in history, but from a knock on the knob. If you try to steal any thunder away from me. And besides, you name it Dimples. What a revolting thought. And what would you name it? Virgilia, I suppose? Far from it, my boy. He had intended doing just that, but now he did not quite dare. After our project, of course. The planet we're heading for will be Zabriska. The suns will be A, B, and C Zabriskai, in order of size. And the watch officer then on duty, Lieutenant L. Stuart Rawlings, will engross these and all other pertinent data in the log. Can you classify him from here, Jack? I can make some guesses. Close enough, probably, for discovery work. Then, after a few minutes, two giants, a blue-white and a bluish-yellow, and a yellow dwarf. Dwarf in the Trojan? That would be my guess, since that is the only place it could stay very long, but you can't tell much from one look. I can tell you one thing, though. Unless your Zabriska is in a system straight beyond this one, it's got to be a planet of the big fellow himself. And, brother, that sun is hot. It's got to be here, Jack. I haven't made that big an error in reading a beam since I was a sophomore. I'll buy that. Well, we're close enough, I guess. Jack killed the driving blasts, but not the Bergenholm. The inertialess vessel stopped instantaneously in open space. Now we've got to find out which one of those twelve or fifteen planets was on our line when that last message was sent. There, we're stable enough, I hope. Open your cameras, Mace. Pull the first plate in fifteen minutes. That ought to give me enough track so I can start the job, since we're at a wide angle to their ecliptic. The work went on for an hour or so. Then— Something coming from the direction of Tellus, the watch officer reported. Big and fast. Shall I hail her? Might as well. But the stranger hailed first. Spaceship Chicago. N-A-2-A-A -A calling. Are you in trouble? Identify yourself, please. Spaceship N-A-774-J acknowledging. No trouble. Northrop! Jack! came Virgil Sam's highly concerned thought. The super-dreadnought flashed alongside, a bare few hundred miles away, and stopped. Why did you stop here? This is where our signal came from, sir. Oh! A hundred thoughts raced through Sam's mind, too fast and too fragmentary to be intelligible. I see you're computing. Would it throw you off too much to go inert and match intrinsics so that I can join you? No, sir. I've got everything I need for a while. Sam's came aboard. Three lensmen studied the chart. Cavenda is there, Sam's pointed out. Trenko is there, off to one side. I felt sure that your signal originated on Cavenda. 
but Zabriska here, while on almost the same line, is less than half as far from Tellus. He did not ask whether the two young lensmen were sure of their findings. He knew. This arouses my curiosity no end. Does it merely complicate the thionite problem, or does it set up an entirely new problem? Go ahead, boys, with whatever you were going to do next." Jack had already determined that the planet they wanted was the second out, Aza Briskai II. He drove the scout as close to the planet as he could without losing complete coverage, stationed it on the line toward Sol. "'Now we wait a bit,' he answered. According to recent periodicity, not less than four hours and not more than ten. With the next signal, we'll nail that transmitter down to within a few feet. Got your spotting screens full out, Mace? Recent periodicity? Sam snapped. It has improved then lately? Very much, sir. That helps immensely. With George Olmsted harvesting broadleaf, it would. It is still one problem. While we wait, shall we study the planet a little? They explored finding that Aza Briskai II was a disappointing planet indeed. It was small, waterless, airless, utterly featureless, utterly barren. There were no elevations, no depressions, no visible markings whatever, not even a meteor crater. Every square yard of its surface was apparently exactly like every other. No rotation, Jack reported, looking up from the bolometer. That sand pile is not inhabited and never will be. I'm beginning to wonder." "'So am I now,' Northrop admitted. I still say that those signals came from this line and distance, but it looks as though they must have been sent from a ship. If so, now that we're here, particularly the Chicago, there will be no more signals. Not necessarily." Again Sam's mind transcended his Tellurian experience and knowledge. He did not suspect the truth, but he was not jumping at conclusions. There may be highly intelligent life, even upon such a planet as this." They waited, and in a few hours a communications beam snapped into life. "'Ready, ready, ready,' it said briskly, for not quite one minute, but that was time enough. Northrop yelped a string of numbers. Jack blasted the little vessel forward and downward. The three watch officers, keen-eyed at their plates, stabbed their visibeams, ultra-beams, and spy-rays along the indicated line. "'And bore straight through the planet if you have to. They may be on the other side,' Jack cautioned sharply. "'They aren't. It's here on this side,' Rowling saw it first. "'Nothing much to it, though. It looks like a relay station.' "'A relay? I'll be a—' Jack started to express an unexpurgated opinion, but shut himself up. Young cubs did not swear in front of the first lensman. Let's land, sir, and look the place over anyway. By all means. They landed and cautiously disembarked. The horizon, while actually quite a little closer than that of Earth, seemed much more distant because there was nothing whatever, no tree, no shrub, no rock or pebble, not even the slightest ripple, to break the geometrical perfection of that surface of smooth, hard, blindingly reflective, fiendishly hot white sand. Sam's was highly dubious at first. A ground temperature of 475 degrees was not to be taken lightly. He did not at all like the looks of that ultra-fervent blue-white sun, and in his wildest imaginings he had never pictured such a desert. Their spacesuits, however, were very well insulated, particularly as to the feet, and highly polished and in lieu of atmosphere there was an almost perfect vacuum. They could stand it for a while. The box which housed the relay station was made of non-ferrous metal and was roughly cubical in shape, perhaps five feet on a side. It was so buried that its upper edge was flush with the surface. Its top, which was practically indistinguishable from the surrounding sand, was not bolted or welded, but was simply laid on loose previous spy-ray inspection having proved that the thing was not booby-trapped, Jack lifted the cover by one edge and all three lensmen studied the mechanisms at close range, learning nothing new. There was an extremely sensitive non-directional receiver, a highly directional sender, a beautifully precise uranium clock director, and an eternal power-pack. There was nothing else. 
What next, sir? Northrop asked. There'll be an incoming signal probably in a couple of days. Shall we stick around and see whether it comes from Cavenda or not? You and Jack had better wait, yes. Sam's thought for minutes. I do not believe now that the signal will come from Cavenda, or that it will ever come twice from the same direction, but we will have to make sure. But I can't see any reason for it. I think I can, sir. This was Northrop's specialty. No spaceship could possibly hit Tellus from here except by accident with a single-ended beam, and they can't use a double-ender because it would have to be on all the time and would be as easy to trace as the Mississippi River. But this planet did all its settling ages ago, which is undoubtedly why they picked it out. And that director in there is a Mark Conti, the second Mark Conti I have ever seen. Whatever that is, Jack put in, and even Sam's thought a question. The most precise thing ever built, the specialist explained. Accuracy limited only by that of determination of relative motions. Give me an accurate enough equation to feed into it, like that tape is doing, and two sighting shots, and I'll guarantee to pour an eighteen-inch beam into any two-foot cup on earth. My guess is that it's aimed at some particular bucket antenna on one of the solar planets. I could spoil its aim easily enough, but I don't suppose that is what you're after. Decidedly not. We want to trace them, without exciting any more suspicion than is absolutely necessary. How often, would you say, do they have to come here to service this station, change tapes and whatever else might be necessary? Change tapes is all. Not very often, by the size of those reels. If they know the relative motions exactly enough, they could compute as far ahead as they care to. I've been timing that reel. It's got pretty close to three months left on it. And more than that much has been used. It's no wonder we didn't see anything. Sam straightened up and stared out across the frightful waste. Look there. I thought I saw something move. It is moving. There's something moving closer than that, and it's really funny. Jack laughed deeply. It's like the paddle wheels, shaft and all, of an old-fashioned river steamboat, rolling along as unconcernedly as you please. He won't miss me by over four feet, but he isn't swerving a hair. I think I'll block him off, just to see what he does. Be careful, Jack, Sam's cautioned sharply. Don't touch it. It may be charged, or worse. Jack took the metal cover, which he was still holding, and by working it back and forth edgewise in the sand, made of it a vertical barrier squarely across the thing's path. The traveller paid no attention, did not alter its steady pace of a couple of miles per hour. It measured about twelve inches long overall. Its paddle-wheel-like extremities were perhaps two inches wide and three inches in diameter. "'Do you think it's actually alive, sir? In a place like this?' "'I'm sure of it. Watch carefully.' It struck the barrier and stopped. That is, its forward motion stopped, but its rolling did not. Its rate of revolution did not change. It either did not know or did not care that its drivers were slipping on the smooth, hard sand, that it could not climb the vertical metal plate, that it was not getting anywhere. "'What a brain!' Northrop chortled, squatting down closer. "'Why doesn't it back up or turn around?' It may be alive, but it certainly isn't very bright. The creature, now in the shadow of the transist's helmet, slowed down abruptly, went limp, collapsed. Get out of his light, Jack snapped, and pushed his friend violently away. And as the vicious sunlight struck it, the native revived and began to revolve as vigorously as before. I've got a hunch. Sounds screwy, never heard of such a thing, but it acts like an energy converter. Each energy, raw and straight. No storage capacity. On this world, he wouldn't need it. A few more seconds in the shade would probably have killed him. But there's no shade here. Therefore, he can't be dangerous. He reached out and touched the middle of the revolving shaft. Nothing happened. He turned it at right angles to the plate. The thing rolled away in a straight line, perfectly contented with the new direction. He recaptured it and stuck a test prod lightly into the sand, just ahead of its shaft and just inside one paddle wheel. Around and around that slim wire the creature went. 
unable, it seemed, to escape from even such a simple trap, perfectly willing, it seemed, to spend all the rest of its life traversing that tiny circle. "'What a brain is right, Mace!' Jack exclaimed. "'What a brain!' "'This is wonderful, boys, really wonderful, something completely new to our science.' Sam's thought was deep with feeling. I am going to see if I can reach its mind or consciousness. Would you like to come along?" Would we? Sam's tuned low and probed, lower and lower, deeper and deeper. And Jack and May stayed with him. The thing was certainly alive. It throbbed and vibrated with vitality. Equally certainly, it was not very intelligent. But it had a definite consciousness of its own existence and therefore, however tiny and primitive, a mind. Although its rudimentary ego could neither receive nor transmit thought, it knew that it was a fontima, that it must roll and roll and roll endlessly, that by virtue of determined rolling its species would continue and would increase. "'Well, that's one for the book!' Jack exclaimed, but Sam's was entranced. "'I would like to find one or two more of them, to find out—' I think I'll take the time. Can you see any more of them, either of you?" No, but we can find some. Stu! Northrop called. Yes? Look around, will you? Find us a couple more of these Fontima things and flick them over here with a tractor. Coming up! And in a few seconds they were there. Are you photographing this, Lance? Sam's called the chief communications officer of the Chicago. We certainly are, sir, all of it. What are they, anyway? Animal, vegetable, or mineral? I don't know. Probably no one of the three, strictly speaking. I'd like to take a couple back to tell us, but I'm afraid that they'll die, even under an atomic lamp. We'll report to the Society." Jack liberated his captive and aimed it to pass within a few feet of one of the newcomers, but the two Fontimas did not ignore each other. Both swerved, so that they came together wheel to wheel. The shafts bent toward each other, each into a right angle. The angles touched and fused. The point of fusion swelled rapidly into a double fist-sized lump. The half-shafts doubled in length. The lump split into four, became four perfect paddle-wheels. Four full-grown Fontimas rolled away from the spot upon which two had met their courses forming two mutually perpendicular straight lines. Beautiful! Sams exclaimed. And notice, boys, the method of avoiding inbreeding. Upon a perfectly smooth planet such as this, no two of those four can ever meet, and the chance is almost vanishingly small that any of their first-generation offspring will ever meet. But I'm afraid I've been wasting time. Take me back out to the Chicago, please, and I'll be on my way. You don't seem at all optimistic, sir," Jack ventured, as the NA-774J approached the Chicago. Unfortunately, I am not. The signal will almost certainly come in from an unpredictable direction, from a ship so far away that even a super-fast cruiser could not get close enough to her to detect. Just a minute, Rod. He lends the elder Kinnison so sharply that both young Lensmen jumped. What is it, Verge? Sams explained rapidly, concluding, So, I would like to have you throw a globe of scouts around this whole Zabriskan system, one detet out and one detet apart, so as to be able to slap a tracer onto any ship laying a beam to this planet from any direction whatever. It would not take too many scouts, would it? Footnote. Detet. The distance at which one spaceship can detect another. E.E.S. No, but it wouldn't be worthwhile. Why not? Because it wouldn't prove a thing except what we already know, that Spaceways is involved in the Thionite racket. The ship would be clean, merely another relay. Oh, you're probably right. If Virgil Sams was in the least put out at this cavalier dismissal of his idea, he made no sign. He thought intensely for a couple of minutes. You are right. I will have to work from the Cavenda end. How are you coming with Operation Bennett? Nice, Kinnison enthused. When you get a couple of days, come over and see it grow. This is a fine world, Verge. It'll be ready. 
I'll do that. Sams broke the connection and called Dronvire. The only change here is for the worse, the Rigelian reported tersely. The slight positive correlation between deaths from Thionite and the arrival of Spaceways vessels has disappeared. There was no need to elaborate on that bare statement. Both Lensmen knew what it meant. The enemy, either in anticipation of statistical analysis or for economic reasons, was rationing his small supply of the drug. And Dalnalton was very much unlike his usual equable self. He was glum and unhappy, so much so that it took much urging to make him report at all. We have, as you know, put our best operatives to work on the interplanetary lines, he said finally, half sullenly. We have secured quite a little data. The accumulating facts, however, point more and more definitely toward an utterly preposterous conclusion. Can you think of any valid reason why the exports and imports of Thionite between Tellus and Mars, Mars and Venus, and Venus and Tellus should be all exactly equal to each other? What? Precisely. That is why Knobos and I are not yet ready to present even a preliminary report. Then Jill. I can't prove it any more than I could before, but I'm pretty sure that Morgan is the boss. I have drawn every picture I can think of with Isaacson in the driver's seat, but none of them fit." She paused, questioningly. I am already reconciled to adopting that view, at least as a working hypothesis. Go ahead. The fact seems to be that Morgan has always had all the left-wingers of the Nationalists under his thumb. Now he and his man Friday, Representative Fleerce, are wooing all the radicals and so-called liberals on our side of both. Senate and House, a new technique for him, and they're offering plenty of the right kind of bait. He has the commentators guessing, but there's no doubt whatever in my mind that he is aiming at next election day and our Galactic Council. And you and Dronvire are sitting idly by, doing nothing, of course? Of course, Jill giggled, but sobered quickly. He's a smooth, smooth worker, Dad. We are organizing, of course, and putting out propaganda of our own, but there's so pitifully little that we can actually do. Look and listen to this for a minute, and you'll see what I mean." In her distant room, Jill manipulated a reel and flipped a switch. A plate came to life, showing Morgan's big, sweating, passionately earnest face. "'And who are these Lensmen, anyway?' Morgan's voice bellowed passionate conviction in every syllable. They are the hired minions of the classes, stabbers in the back, crooks and scoundrels, tools of ruthless wealth. They are hirelings of the interplanetary bankers, those unspeakable excrescences on the body politic who are still grinding down into the dirt under an iron heel the face of the common man. In the guise of democracy, they are trying to set up the worst, the most outrageous tyranny that this universe has ever—" Jill snapped the switch viciously. And a lot of people swallow that, that bilge, she almost snarled. And if they have the brains of a— of even that Zabriskan Fontima Mace told me about, they wouldn't. But they do. I know they do. We have known all along that he is a masterly actor. We now know that he is more than that. Yes, and we're finding out that no appeal to reason, no psychological countermeasures will work. Dronfire and I agree that you'll have to arrange matters so that you can do solid months of stumping yourself. Personally. It may come to that, but there's a lot of other things to do first. Sams broke the connection and thought. He did not consciously try to exclude the two youths but his mind was working so fast, in such a disjointed fashion, that they could catch only a few fragments. The incomprehensible vastness of space, tracing, detection, Cavenda's one tiny, fast-moving moon, back and solidly to detection. Mace, Sam's thought then carefully. As a specialist in such things, why is it that the detectors of the smallest scout, lifeboat even, have practically the same range as those of the largest liners and battleships. 
Noise level and hash, sir, from the atomics? But can't they be screened out? Not entirely, sir, without blocking reception completely. I see. Suppose, then, that all atomics aboard were to be shut down, that for the necessary heat and light we use electricity, from storage or primary batteries or from a generator driven by an internal combustion motor or a heat engine. Could the range of detection then be increased? Tremendously, sir. My guess is that the limiting factor would then be the cosmics. I hope you're right. While you are waiting for the next signal to come in, you might work out a preliminary design for such a detector. If, as I anticipate, this Zabriska proves to be a dead end, Operation Zabriska ends here, becomes a part of Zwilnik, and you two will follow me at Max to tell us. You, Jack, are very badly needed on Operation Boscone. You and I, Mace, will make appropriate alterations aboard a J-class vessel of the patrol. Chapter 12 Approaching Cavenda in his dead-black, converted scout ship, Virgil Sams cut his drive, killed his atomics, and turned on his super-powered detectors. For five full detets in every direction, throughout a spherical volume of over ten detets in diameter, space was void of ships. Some activity was apparent upon the planet dead ahead, but the first lensman did not worry about that. The drug runners would, of course, have atomics in their plants, even if there were no spaceships actually on the planet, which there probably were. What he did worry about was detection. There would be plenty of detectors, probably automatic. Not only ordinary sub-ethereals, but electros and radars as well. He flashed up to within one and a quarter detets, stopped, and checked again. Space was still empty. Then, after making a series of observations, he went inert and established an intrinsic velocity which he hoped would be close enough. He again shut off his atomics and started the sixteen-cylinder diesel engine, which would do its best to replace them. That best was none too good, but it would do. Besides driving the Bergen home, it could furnish enough kilodynes of thrust to produce a velocity many times greater than any attainable by inert matter. It used a lot of oxygen per minute, but it would not run for very many minutes. With her atomics out of action, his ship would not register upon the plates of the long-range detectors universally used. Since she was nevertheless traveling faster than light, neither electromagnetic detector webs nor radar could see her. Good enough. Sam's was not the system's best computer, nor did he have the system's finest instruments. His positional error could be corrected easily enough, but as he drove nearer and nearer to Cavenda, keeping toward the last in line with its one small moon, he wondered more and more as to how much of an allowance he should make for error in his intrinsic, which he had set up practically by guess. And there was another variable, the cutoff. He slowed down to just over one light, but even at that comparatively slow speed, an error of one millisecond at cutoff meant a displacement of two hundred miles. He switched the spotter into the Berg's cutoff circuit, set it for three hundred miles, and waited tensely at his controls. The relays clicked, the driving force expired, the vessel went inert. Sam's eyes, flashing from instrument to instrument, told him that matters could have been worse. His intrinsic was neither straight up, as he had hoped, nor straight down, as he had feared, but almost exactly halfway between the two, straight out. He discovered that fact just in time. In another second or two, he would have been out beyond the moon's protecting bulk and thus detectable from Cavenda. He went free, flashed back to the opposite boundary of his area of safety, went inert, and put the full power of the bellowing diesel to the task of bucking down his erroneous intrinsic, losing altitude continuously. Again and again he repeated the maneuver, and thus, grimly and stubbornly, he fought his ship to ground. He was very glad to see that the surface of the satellite was rougher, rockier, ruggeder, and more cratered even than that of Earth's Luna. Upon such a terrain as this, it would be next to impossible to spot even a moving vessel, if it moved carefully. By a series of short and careful inertialist hops, correcting his intrinsic velocity after each one by an inert collision with the ground, 
he maneuvered his vessel into such a position that Cavenda's enormous globe hung directly overhead. Breathing a profoundly deep breath of relief, he killed the big engine, cut in his fully charged accumulators, and turned on detector and spy ray. He would see what he could see. His detector showed that there was only one point of activity on the whole planet. He located it precisely. Then, after cutting his spy ray to minimum power, he approached it gingerly, yard by yard. Stopped. As he had more than half expected, there was a spy ray block. A big one, almost two miles in diameter. It would be almost directly beneath him, or rather, almost straight overhead, in about three hours. Sam's had brought along a telescope, considerably more powerful than the telescopic visiplate of his scout. Since the surface gravity of this moon was low, scarcely one-fifth that of Earth, he had no difficulty in lugging the parts out of the ship or in setting the thing up. But even the telescope did not do much good. The moon was close to Govenda, as astronomical distances go, but really worthwhile astronomical optical instruments simply are not portable. Thus the lensman saw something that, by sufficient stretch of the imagination, could have been a factory and his eyes straining at the tantalizing limit of visibility, he even made himself believe that he saw a toothpick-shaped object and a darkly circular blob, either of which could have been the spaceship of the outlaws. He was sure, however, of two facts. There were no real cities upon Cavenda. There were no modern spaceports, or even airfields. He dismounted the scope, stored it, set his detectors, and waited. He had to sleep at times, of course, but any ordinary detector rig can be set to sound off at any change in its status, and Sam's was no ordinary rig. Wherefore, when the drugmonger's vessel took off, Sam's left Cavenda as unobtrusively as he had approached it and swung into that vessel's line. Sam's strategy had been worked out long since. On his diesel, at a distance of just over one detet, he would follow the outlaw as fast as he could long enough to establish his line. He would then switch to atomic drive and close up to between one and two detets. Then, again, go on to diesel for a check. He would keep this up for as long as might prove necessary. As far as any of the lensmen knew, spaceways always used regular liners or freighters in this business, and this scout was much faster than any such vessel. And even if, highly improbable thought, the enemy ship was faster than his own, it would still be within range of those detectors when it got to wherever it was that it was going. But how wrong Sam's was! At his first check, instead of being not over two detets away, the quarry was three and a half. At the second, the distance was four and a quarter. At the third, almost exactly five. Scowling, Sam's watched the erstwhile brilliant point of light fade into darkness, that circular blob that he had almost seen then had been the spaceship, but it had not been a sphere, as he had supposed. Instead, it had been a teardrop, sticking, sharp tail down, in the ground. Ultra-fast. This was the result. But ideas had blown up under him before. They probably would again. He resumed atomic drive and made arrangements with the port admiral to rendezvous with him and the Chicago at the earliest possible time. "'What is there along that line?' he demanded of the super-dreadnought's chief pilot, even before junction had been made. "'Nothing, sir, that we know of,' that worthy reported, after studying his charts. He boarded the gigantic ship of war, and with Kinnison, poured over those same charts." Your best bet is a reading, I think, Kinnison concluded finally. Not too near your line, but they could very easily figure that a one-day dogleg would be a good investment. And Spaceways owns it, you know, from core to planetary limits, the richest uranium mines in existence. Made to order. Nobody would suspect a uranium ship. How about throwing a globe around a reading? Sam's thought for minutes. No. Not yet, at least. We don't know enough yet. I know it. That's why it looks to me like a good time and place to learn something, Kinnison argued. We know, almost know at least, that a super-fast ship, 
carrying thionite, has just landed there. This is the hottest lead we've had. I say englobe the planet, declare martial law, and not let anything in or out until we find it. Somebody there must know something, a lot more than we do. I say hunt him out and make him talk. You're just popping off, Rod. You know as well as I do that nabbing a few of the small fry isn't enough. We can't move openly until we can strike high. I suppose not, Kinnison grumbled. But we know so damned little, Verge. Little enough, Sams agreed. Of the three main divisions, only the political aspect is at all clear. In the drug division, we know where thionite comes from and where it is processed, and Aridan may be, probably is, another link. On the other end, we know a lot of peddlers and a few middlemen, nobody higher. We have no actual knowledge whatever as to who the higher-ups are or how they work, and it's the bosses we want. Concerning the pirates, we know even less. Murgatroyd may be no more a man's name than Zwilnik is. Before you get too far away from the subject, what are you going to do about a Aridan? Nothing, for the moment, would be best, I believe. However, Konobos and Dal Nalton should switch their attention from Spaceways passenger liners to the uranium ships from Aridan to all three of the inner planets. Check? Check. Particularly since it explains so beautifully the merry-go-round they have been on so long, chasing the same packages of dope backwards and forwards so many times that the corners of the boxes got worn round. We've got to get the top men, and they're smart. Which reminds me, Morgan as big boss does not square up with the Morgan that you and Fairchild smacked down so easily when he tried to investigate the hill. A loud-mouthed, chiseling politician might have a lockbox full of documentary evidence about party bosses and power deals and chorus girls and Martian tackle coats, but the man we're after very definitely would not. You're telling me? This point was such a sore one that Sam's relapsed into idiom. The boys should have cracked that box a week ago, but they struck a knot. I'll see if they know anything yet. Tune in, Rod. Ray! He lends a thought at his cousin. Yes, Verge? Have you got a spy ray into that lockbox yet? Glad you called. Yes, last night. Empty. Empty as a sub-deb skull. Except for an atomic-powered gimmick that it took Bergenholm's whole laboratory almost a week to neutralize. I see. Thanks. Off. Sam's turned to Kinnison. Well? Nice. A mighty smart operator. Kinnison gave credit ungrudgingly. Now I'll buy your picture. What a man. But now, and I've got my ears pinned back, what was it you started to say about pirates? Just that we have very little to go on, except for the kind of stuff they seem to like best, and the fact that even armed escorts have not been able to protect certain types of shipments of late. The escorts, too, have disappeared. But with these facts as bases... It seems to me that we could arrange something, perhaps like this. A fast, sleek freighter and a heavy battlecruiser bored steadily through the interstellar void. The merchantman carried a fabulously valuable cargo, not bullion or jewels or plate of price, but things literally above price, machine tools of highest precision, delicate optical and electrical instruments, fine watches and chronometers. She also carried first lensman Virgil Sams. And aboard the warship there was Roderick Kinnison. For the first time in history, a mere battle cruiser bore a port admiral's flag. As far as the detectors of those two ships could reach, space was empty of man made craft. But the two lensmen knew that they were not alone. One and a half detets away, loafing along at the freighter's speed and paralleling her course, in a hemispherical formation open to the front, there flew six tremendous teardrops. Super dreadnoughts of whose existence no Tellurian or colonial government had even an inkling. They were the fastest and deadliest craft yet built by man, the first fruits of Operation Bennett. And they too carried lensmen, Costigan, Jack Kinnison, Northrop, Dronvire of Rigel IV, Roadbush, and Cleveland. Nor was there need of detectors. The eight lensmen were in as close communication as though they had been standing in the same room. 
On your toes, men, came Sam's quiet thought. We are about to pass within a few light minutes of an uninhabited solar system. No Tellurian-type planets at all. This may be it. Tune to Kinnison on one side and to your captains on the other. Take over, Rod. At one instant the ether, for one full detet in every direction, was empty. In the next, three intensely brilliant spots of detection flashed into being, in line with the dead planet so invitingly close at hand. This development came as a surprise, since only two raiders had been expected, a battleship to take care of the escort, a cruiser to take the merchantman. The fact that the pirates had become cautious or suspicious, and had sent three super-dreadnoughts on the mission, however, did not operate to change the patrol's strategy. For Sams had concluded, and Dronvier and Bergenholm and Rularion of Jupiter had agreed, that the real commander of the expedition would be aboard the vessel that attacked the freighter. In the next instant, then, each lensman saw what Roderick Kinnison saw in the very instant of his seeing it, six more points of hard white light sprang into being upon the plates of the guileful freighter and the decoying cruiser. "'Jack and Mace, take the leader,' Kinnison snapped out the thought. "'Dronvier and Costigan, right wing. He's the one that's going after the freighter. Fred and Lyman, left wing. Hype!' The pirate ships flashed up, filling ether and sub-ether alike with a solid mush of interference through which no call for help could be driven. Two super-dreadnoughts against the cruiser, one against the freighter. The former, of course, had been expected to offer more than a token resistance. Battle cruisers of the patrol were powerful vessels, both on offense and defense, and it was a known and recognized fact that the men of the patrol were men. The pirate commander who attacked the freighter, however, was a surprised pirate indeed. His first beam, directed well forward, well ahead of the precious cargo, should have wrought the same havoc against the screens and wall shields and structure as a white-hot poker would against a pad of lukewarm butter. Practically the whole nose section, including the control room, should have whiffed outward into space in gobbets and streamers of molten and gaseous metal. But nothing of the sort happened. This merchantman was no pushover. No ordinary screens protected that particular freighter and the person of First Lensman Sams. Roderick Kinnison had very thoroughly seen to that. In sheer mass, her screen generators outweighed her entire cargo, heavy as that cargo was by more than two to one. Thus the pirates' beam stormed and struck and clawed and clung uselessly. They did not penetrate. And as the surprised attacker shoved his power up and up, to his absolute ceiling of effort, the only result was to increase the already tremendous pyrotechnic display of energies cascading in all directions from the fiercely radiant defenses of the Tellurian freighter. And in a few seconds the commanding officers of the other two attacking battleships were also surprised. The battle cruiser screens did not go down, even under the combined top effort of two super-dreadnoughts and she did not have a beam hot enough to light a match. She must be all screen. But before the startled outlaws could do anything about the realization that they, instead of being the trappers, were in cold fact the trapped, all three of them were surprised again, the last surprise that any of them was ever to receive. Six mighty teardrops, vastly bigger, faster, more powerful than their own, were rushing upon them, blanketing all channels of communication as efficiently and as enthusiastically as they themselves had been doing an instant before. Being out simply and ruthlessly to kill and not to capture, four of the newcomers from Bennett polished off the cruiser's two attackers in very short order. They simply flashed in, went inert at the four corners of an imaginary tetrahedron, and threw everything they had, and they had plenty. Possibly, just barely possibly, there may have been, somewhere, a space battle shorter than that one, but there certainly was never one more violent. Then the four set out after their two sister ships and the remaining pirate, who was frantically devoting his every effort to the avoidance of engagement. But with six ships, each one of which was of vastly greater individual power than his own, at the six corners of an octahedron of which he was the geometrical center, 
his ability to cut tractor beams and to squirt out from between two opposed pressers did him no good whatever. He was englobed, or rather, to apply the correct terminology to an operation involving so few units, he was boxed. To blow the one remaining raider out of the ether would have been easy enough, but that was exactly what the patrolmen did not want to do. They wanted information. Wherefore, each of the patrol ships directed a dozen or so beams upon the scintillating protective screens of the enemy. Enough so that every square yard of defensive web was under direct attack. As rapidly as it could be done without losing equilibrium or synchronization, the power of each beam was stepped up until the wildly violet incandescence of the pirate screen showed that it was hovering on the very edge of failure. Then, in the instant, needle beamers went furiously to work. The screen was already loaded to its limit. No transfer of defensive energy was possible. Thus tremendously overloaded locally, locally it flared through the ultraviolet into the black and went down, and the fiercely penetrant daggers of pure force stabbed and stabbed and stabbed. The engine room went first, even though the needlers had to gnaw a hundred-foot hole straight through the pirate craft in order to find the vital installations. Then, enough damage done so that spy rays could get in, the rest of the work was done with precision and dispatch. In a matter of seconds the pirate hulk lay helpless, and the patrolman peeled her like an orange, or rather more like an amateur cook very wastefully peeling a potato. Resistless knives of energy sheared off tail section and nose section, top and bottom, port and starboard sides, then slabbed off the corners of what was left until the control room was almost bared to space. Then, as soon as the intrinsic velocities could possibly be matched, board and storm. With drawn fire of Rigel Four in the lead, closely followed by Costigan, Northrop, Kinnison the Younger, and a platoon of armed and armored space marines. Sams and the two scientists did not belong in such a melee as that which was to come and knew it. Kinnison the Elder did not belong either, but did not know it. In fact, he cursed fluently and bitterly at having to stay out. Nevertheless, out he stayed. Dronvire, on the other hand, did not like to fight. The very thought of actual, bodily, hand-to-hand -hand combat revolted every fiber of his being. In view of what the spy-ray men were reporting, however, and of what all the lensmen knew of pirate psychology, Dronvire had to get into that control room first, and he had to get there fast. And if he had to fight, he could, and physically he was wonderfully well equipped for just such activity. To his immense physical strength, the natural concomitant of a force of gravity more than twice Earth's, the armor which so encumbered the Tellurian battlers was a scarcely noticeable impediment. His sense of perception, which could not be barred by any material substance, kept him fully informed of every development in his neighborhood. His literally incredible speed enabled him not merely to parry a blow aimed at him, but to bash out the brains of the would-be attacker before that blow could be more than started. And whereas a human being can swing only one space axe or fire only two ray guns at a time, the Rigelian plunged through space toward what was left of the pirate vessel, swinging not one or two space axes, but four each held in a lithe and supple, but immensely strong, tentacular hand. Why axes? Why not Lewistons or rifles or pistols? Because the space armor of that day could withstand almost indefinitely the output of two or three handheld projectors, because the resistance of its defensive fields varied directly as the cube of the velocity of any material projectile encountering them. Thus, and strangely enough, the advance of science had forced the readoption of that long extinct weapon. Most of the pirates had died, of course, during the dismemberment of their ship. Many more had been picked off by the needle beam gunners. In the control room, however, there was a platoon of elite guards, clustered so closely about the commander and his officers that needles could not be used, a group that would have to be wiped out by hand. If the attack had come by way of the only doorway, so that the pirates could have concentrated their weapons upon one or two patrolmen, the commander might have had time enough to do what he was under compulsion to do. But while the patrolmen were still in space, 
a plane of force sheared off the entire side of the room, a tractor beam jerked the detached wall away, and the attackers floated in en masse. Weightless combat is not at all like any form of gymnastics known to us ground-grippers. It is much more difficult to master, and at times of stress the muscles revert involuntarily and embarrassingly to their wanted gravity-field techniques. Thus the endeavors of most of the battlers upon both sides, while earnest enough and deadly enough of intent, were almost comically unproductive of result. In a matter of seconds, frantically struggling figures were floating from wall to ceiling to wall to floor, striking wildly, darting backward from the violence of their own fierce swings. The Tellurian lensmen, however, had had more practice and remembered their lessons better. Jack Kinnison, soaring into the room, grabbed the first solid thing he could reach, a post. Pulling himself down to the floor, he braced both feet, sighted past the nearest foeman, swung his axe, and gave a tremendous shove. Such was his timing that in the instant of maximum effort the beak of his atrociously effective weapon encountered the pirate's helmet, and that was that. He wrenched his axe free and shoved the corpse away in such a direction that the reaction would send him against a wall at the floor-line, in position to repeat the maneuver. Since Mason Northrop was heavier and stronger than his friend, his technique was markedly different. He dove for the chart-table, which, of course, was welded to the floor. He hooked one steel-shod foot around one of the table's legs and braced the other against its top. Weightless but inert, it made no difference whether his position was vertical or horizontal or anywhere between. From this point of vantage, with his length of body and arm and axe, he could cover a lot of room. He reached out, hooked bill of axe into belt or line snap or angle of armor, and pulled. And as the helplessly raging pirate floated past him, he swung and struck. And that, too, was that. Dronvire of Rigel IV did not rush to the attack. He had never been and was not now either excited or angry. Indeed, it was only empirically that he knew what anger and excitement were. He had never been in any kind of a fight. Therefore, he paused for a couple of seconds to analyze the situation, and to determine his own most efficient method of operation. He would not have to be in physical contact with the pirate captain to go to work on his mind, but he would have to be closer than this, and he would have to be free from physical attack while he concentrated. He perceived what Kinnison and Costigan and Northrop were doing, and knew why each was working in a different fashion. He applied that knowledge to his own mass, to his own musculature, to the length and strength of his arms, each one of which was twice as long and ten times as strong as the trunk of an elephant. He computed forces and leverages, actions and reactions, points of application, stresses and strains. He threw away two of his axes. The two empty arms reached out, each curling around the neck of a pirate. Two axes flashed grazing each pinioning arm so nearly that it seemed incredible that the sharp edges did not shear away the Rigelian's own armor. Two heads floated away from two bodies, and Dronvire reached for two more. And two, and two, and two. Calm and dispassionate, but not wasting a motion or a millisecond, Dronvire accomplished more in less time than all the Tellurians in the room. Costigan, Northrop, Kinnison, attend! he launched a thought. I have no time to kill more of them. The commander is dying of a self-inflicted wound, and I have important work to do. See to it, please, that these remaining creatures do not attack me while I am doing it. Dronvire tuned his mind to that of the pirate and probed. Although dying, the pirate captain offered fierce resistance, but the Rigelian was not alone. Attuned to his mind, working smoothly with it, giving it strengths and qualities which no Rigelian ever had had or ever would have, were the two strongest minds of earth, that of Rod the Rock Kinnison, with the driving force, the indomitable will, the transcendent urge of all human heredity, and that of Virgil Sams, with all that had made him first lensman. Tell! that terrific triple mind demanded, with a force which simply could not be denied. Where are you from? Resistance is useless. 
yours or that of those whom you serve. Your bases and powers are smaller and weaker than ours, since Spaceways is only a corporation and we are the Galactic Patrol. Tell! Who are your bosses? Tell! Tell! Under that irresistible urge there appeared, foggily and without any hint of knowledge of name or of spatial coordinates, an embattled planet, very similar in a smaller way to the patrol's own Bennett, and, even more foggily, but still not so blurred but that their features were unmistakably recognizable, the images of two men, that of Murgatroyd, the pirate chief, completely strange to both Kinnison and Sam's, and, back of Murgatroyd and above him, that of Big Jim Town.